So, uh, well, uh, you know, we have a, a, a group of uh, folks from Bell Labs. Bell Labs, by the way, is a part of Alfred and Lucent. So, I'll be talking about Bell Labs mostly here. And uh, so, you know, and you heard some of the presentations, some of the work that we've been doing. But before I get into one deep, uh, topic that I will get into some more detail, I'm not going to talk about a generic vision. Uh, but I will uh, get into one area, in fact, which matches very closely with what Dan Kaufman mentioned at the beginning. How do you bring network and cloud together? So first, I'll uh, just uh, show you, uh, uh, you know, uh, Alfred Lucent. It's a company is headquartered here. Headquarters are right next to Alfred Tower. They used to be in Labozi. They were moved here recently. This is a fairly global company. Uh, it has, uh, let's see. Uh, let me see, go back. Okay, so this company is in about 130 countries, it's, uh, you know, and the revenue is kind of equally divided with North America, uh, Europe, and the rest of the world. And there, you know, it's in 130 countries and a fairly large company. And uh, Bell Labs, this is what I've been focusing on. It has uh, about a thousand researchers and it's a worldwide organization. And in fact, uh, uh, I think all the <laughs> steering committee members I met here, the students, uh, are in one of the locations at least. You know. And also I'm sure this is true for folks here at Henry also. So again, uh, I, I, you know, uh, our main mission is to try to help Alcatel loosen coming up with differentiating products. But in addition to this, we also try to define the future also. What are some of the break points that are going to change the world? Sometimes, the business units are not too happy about it. I'll give you one example of this. Uh, this was uh, uh, back in 98, 99. There were a bunch of researchers at Bell Labs. They went and told, uh, uh, you know, this the division that was building uh, these last switches, uh, something called 5 ESS, and there was probably that was a Lucent, and there was a similar product uh, uh, on Alcatel also. So these guys are going to say, you know, whatever you're doing is going to disappear. And they were locked out of this place. Uh, you know, so this was, uh, they, were, they had a business of a, uh, something like $10 billion, the profit of something like $6 billion. And this happened. So our uh, job is to uh, kind of identify discontinuities. Another example was uh, there was a student of uh, Henning and his student, Jonathan Rosenberg, they were working on SIP. So initially, again, they got a lot of resistance. But again, look at the world, how it changed. So it's not just, our mission is not just to help the business units, but also to identify some of the technologies that will uh, change. You know, for example, flat wireless networks is another one. So again, uh, it's to help in, to the marketplace, but also look into the future also. <laughs> so now this is a global organization, uh, you know, mostly, uh, most of Bell Labs used to be in New Jersey, uh, but now, you know, after, uh, let's see, what happened? We need a Okay. A better connection? Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks for pointing this out. Okay. Let's see. Okay, so, uh, again, uh, New Jersey is one of the major locations, but uh, there are three major locations here in Europe. Is one south of uh, Paris in Valorso, is another one in Antwerp, and then the third one in Stuttgart. So these locations have uh, something like 200 to 300 researchers, and then uh, there are smaller locations around the world, as you can see. So I'm not going to go through, but this is a, it's a global organization. So, and as I was talking to the members of the steering uh, committee here, it seems their students are in many different locations. It's not just. Uh, in fact, uh, one of his students is in India, yes. right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so again, Bell Labs, uh, you know, has an illustrious history, goes back from like 80, 90 years, so I'm not going to go through. I just want to show you one picture, because sometimes people believe that this is the past history. There are three winners of uh, 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 natural medals of technology from Bell Labs. So this is Herbert Kogelnik. He's the godfather of optical networking, as you know, things like WTM. He created a team that's probably the best. And then this is Jim West. 
He did a lot of research on speech processing. This is El Cho. He was almost a contender for, and almost got Nobel Prize for his work on some material ME process. So, and then there are a bunch of other you know, awards that we have, you know, Bell Labs has won in the recent years, but I'm not going to go through that. Probably many of you know this. Now, uh, the, uh, uh, you, you know, this is a bunch of inventions that Bell Labs has made over the years, so I'm not going to go through this. Many of you probably know this. I just point out cellular concept and more recently something called light radio. Uh, this is something where you know these, uh, you know, the uh, antennas will be uh, will be like in the form of a cube that you can put even behind billboards. Uh, so then there are a bunch of other inventions. I don't know how many of these you can see. Can you? Let's see. Okay. All right. Okay. So this is uh, information theory is the most important one in that one. And let's see again what's happening. Okay. And uh, let's see. So again, uh, perhaps most of you know there are a bunch of uh, uh, good inventions that were have been made in recent years. For example, one of them is photonic integrated circuits. This is like you know you have photonics and uh, silicon. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. transistors on the same <coughs> substrate. In fact, the last talk was on how do you interconnect things together. Something like this probably will be fairly exceptional in terms of this, you know. So, I'm not, uh, as I mentioned, I'm not going to give you a vision of, uh, uh, you know, what, uh, uh, let's see, what's going on here? This connection. This connection? Okay, so I'm going to uh, talk about uh, uh, one program we have, which uh, is, uh, I would say is the flagship program of our networking research today, something we call Network Cloud. Okay, so clouds are important, all of you know, what the clouds have done is basically they made computing like utilities, uh, you know, this is similar things happened in the industrial revolution. What happened was factories could produce equal to whatever uh, their source of power used to be. But once they were electrical utilities, then they could produce as much as they could, and this really uh, uh, changed the world. The same way computing is also changing. This is an example, you know, curve for a uh, startup that was started in New York, something called Animoto. It was a small, uh, you know, it, it was a very small startup. It had something like uh, five to ten, uh, uh, you know, servers, this was hosted in Amazon Cloud. Then there was an article about them in New York Times. And suddenly the number of uh, servers they needed <laughs> went up to, you can see, something like 5,000. But the interesting thing is you also see that it's going down also after that. So they had really no difficulty because it was in the cloud. So uh, again, this appears to be a fairly mature area. So what can we do in this area? So here is a new angle. Again, uh, this is something that I would like you to remember. Now, if you look at current uh, cloud computing centers, these are, uh, you know, huge data centers, as large as 11 football fields large. They are very close to the sources of power. And here, uh, you know, uh, you can host applications that are uh, done more in background. But they result in high latency. So the version of cloud computing that we are proposing, and in fact, we have a product that's based on this also. By the way, this is an example of something where there's very good research being done. Also, there's a product also coming out from the company. Okay, so what we do here is that we spread out computing resources in many data centers. And these data centers are put in central offices of uh, these companies. Now, the, uh, these data centers are in right next to the access lines. So what this means is that you can really deal with very high bandwidth applications. Also, the delays are very, very short also. So uh, this is, that's why we call this network cloud. Now, the first chart that uh, Dan presented, he had three themes. This was one of them. So in fact, uh, we have a major program in this area. So again, uh, it's fairly obvious that uh, approach like this will help in dealing with uh, low latency uh, and high bandwidth applications. 
And again, this also has fairly high for tolerance because there are multiple data centers together. So essentially, these data centers, along with the network, will be like a large virtual data center. Now, there are uh, very interesting research problems that come here, which is that you know how do you do resource allocation or something like this. Traditionally, there has been work done on resource allocation in networks, then in data centers. But this somehow brings both of these two together. So one of our top researchers, who well, many of you know him, P. V. Lakshman, he's leading a group in this area uh, on the resource. But there are a number of other problems that we are working on also. Let me just get some more. So this is a picture of uh, the same, which is that you know there are these large data centers at the top, and then at the bottom we are somehow bringing everything together, and there are a bunch of these small data centers. The question are you saying this is a replacement for large data centers, or this is in addition to the large data centers you may want to have some at the edges? Oh, this is a, a this is not a replacement for data centers because this solution is not going to give you uh, cycles at the lowest price points. For that, you go to these huge data centers, but there are applications that require. For example, we, I, I'll show you one uh, application where we, what we want to do is, in fact, we take SDN concept to an extreme. This is something I'll show you. We have a product called Light Radio. In fact, it's a product concept. It, parts of this being done. So what you do is you put these small radio heads everywhere. Then you have a fiber that takes these radio signals get sampled at twice the maximum frequency. You send these. Uh, these samples to a data center, and this is where the process. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're going to send them somewhere close to Hoover Dam, that's not going to work. Mm -hmm. so, so, an approach like this is really very important. Mm -hmm. So, this is like uh, I would say niche market, mm -hmm. but could be I, I, I would believe that this would be uh, you know a very high margin market, and this fits in very nicely with what service providers do. So in fact, uh, we have a product uh, from Alcatraz and Lucent that's called a cloud band. So our research teams are working very closely with them. This uh, cloud band, this, this team is headquartered in Israel, and there's really a very close relationship between the research teams here, this, uh, in, uh, between Bell Labs and this one. So, so I, in fact, I'll talk about some of that research also. So again, this is just a vision of uh, you know how uh, uh, you know. Uh, this cloud computing has evolved. First, you know, there were these, uh, you know, uh, there were these data centers where, you know, you could go and rent a cage, and you will go and put your own servers in them. Then, what people found was that these servers were not being used very well. So then, there was something like VMware. They come up with uh, virtualization solutions. That means, for a single customer, you can share. Then again, there was you know you can do further statistical multiplexing. This is the uh, conventional cloud computing. These are elastic clouds, like amazing. And what I'm talking about here is a network cloud. We are bringing network and clouds together. So this is like a, a, a niche for uh, a, you know. Now this uh, uh, you know opens up a lot of interesting research problems. You know, in fact, uh, it's amazing the amount of interest that has generated within the labs. So the first one is, you know, when you have all these small data centers and a network connecting them, you need, you need to even find out what is out there. So you need to do uh, a discovery of resources, both computing, storage, as well as for the network. So you gather this information, but you know, it, this information has to be somehow uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, abstracted out in some form so that you can apply some reasonable algorithms to them, and then you have to uh, send them over to a resource allocation scheme. So for this, uh, uh, we are using uh, uh, a payload protocol that ITF has defined, something called ALTO. ALTO is just a payload <coughs> protocol. There are a lot of algorithms that go behind it also for abstracting of network, et cetera. Yes? So does the customer have the capability to shape the quality of service, or it's only the provider who does it? Well, uh, no, no <coughs> customer has, in fact, uh, as I'll show you that. I'll show you a, a, a bunch of resource allocation schemes that we have worked on, and uh, there are a lot of different types of constraints that you can put. Clearly, there <coughs> had to be resources available in the network, and there's been a lot of interesting algorithmic work that has been done in this area also. So that I'll, I'll talk about. 
So first part I'm just talking about is the, the discovery of, uh, of the resources, you know. And for this we use this. Alto is a protocol that was de uh, defined for the, by the peer-to-peer -peer community, but we are using that in this uh, network cloud. So in fact, uh, uh, we have built a server based on this. And in fact, uh, uh, many of our business units are not using this also. But again, I want to emphasize, it's not, ITF just gives a payload protocol. It does not give the algorithms. There's a lot of work that's required when you get all this information from all these. For example, there are these uh, peering systems in networks that do peering at OSPF level. You get that information. You get information from data centers, and you kind of merge them together. And then you, you, know, you may want to look at this information <coughs> at uh, uh, you know different levels of detail you know? so there's a fair amount of work that's been done in this area uh, so by the way i never understood how itf comes up with names maybe there are some folks here who play a major role in itf they maybe they can explain to me the name for i alto stands for application layer traffic optimization as i mentioned this was done for peer to peer uh, 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 you know systems and again uh, uh, you know, Bell Labs has played a major role in this, both in ITF as well as in IRTF. Now, I'll come to, uh, 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 you know, uh, I would say, a uh, subject that will be a lot of uh, interest to this audience. Now, unfortunately, I do not have any equations here. Mm -hmm. But th this work has been done mostly that I'm talking about here by T.V. Lakshman and his team. And he has a bunch of papers. So if you're interested, I can, uh, you know, send you those papers. So again, uh, uh, as I explained before, we want to do resource allocation for computing, network, as well as for storage. And uh, we want to have several le uh, level guarantees. So SLAs will not only have uh, bandwidth, but also will have needs for the computing uh, and also the delay requirements also. This is an online system. So let me request come one at a time. You don't know what the future will be. So what you want to do is you want to allocate resources in such a way so that maximum amount of resources are available for the future. So and, uh, this will help us in dealing with en as many requests as possible. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, we have done a lot of work on for different types of applications, for example, gaming, etc. Again, uh, uh, this is again a point which I made earlier, so I'm not going to go through. Uh, problems like this have been solved for classical uh, uh, data centers, but for uh, these uh, resource placement in uh, uh, these network cloud is, uh, you know, uh, much more complex because you can have, have all kinds of constraints. You may say that, oh, the delays have to be, say, less than 50 milliseconds. For example, by the way, I talk about cloud band, the delays there have to be like in milliseconds. And then, uh, there may be some cost limits also. Maybe there are some background type of computation that you may want to do in large data centers. You may not want to do in these small data centers. And then, uh, you know, <laughs> delays uh, uh, is something that is the, the main value of, the, of this system. And that's something that, uh, you know, we can specify. So, you, so a user can come and say that I need to run this application. I need so many uh, computing resources. I need to have uh, uh, so, uh, it's a delay less than a certain number. I need to perhaps have information stored in two different uh, places so that if one of them fails, uh, you know, it's information available somewhere else. By the way, there is a lot of money for something. <coughs> you know, uh, the companies in, on Wall Street, they build private networks to, so that they can get information little quicker than the competition. So this is something which is very important for uh, certain app there. Yeah. So let's see. OK, so there are, uh, uh, this is a tough problem. You know, you want to, uh, OK, what's going on here? I think it's going to okay. touch the <laughs> cable. Huh? OK, OK, so I think it's a cable. no, I'm not touching the I'm cable. Uh, this, uh, the laptop? The laptop. But it's okay. I mean, we're losing it for just a couple of seconds each time. I just want to see whether. <laughs> okay. Hopefully, this will do better. So, again, you know, uh, uh, we want to admit as many users as we can, 
and uh, the customers, uh, you know, want uh, to get the best service that they can. And then, uh, you know, in normally in uh, these cloud systems, you will, you know, large clouds will say, I need so many VMs, but you have many more constraints here that you have in that. So this leads to a lot of interesting optimization problems that uh, could be solved. In fact, this is what uh, has been done. Uh, some, by the way, some of this work is already in this product that I talked about. So this is, you know, how do you place these algorithms? How do you specify these uh, policies? And how do you, uh, you know, uh, come up with a scheme that gives you a, a fairly optimal result, but at the same time, that doesn't take forever to do it also. And by the way, as you will expect, that uh, the complexity will grow with the number of constraints. So uh, some of you know mathematics infinitely better than me. So this uses primal dual optimization method. In fact, I have a reference to the paper that uh, T. V. Lakshman and Murli Kodayam have used in this area. So this again, uh, this is fairly obvious for this audience, which is that you know, when there's a polynomial algorithm, that's the optimal result. But if that's not the case, then you do you come up with an approximation technique, which is you know, uh, you know which is reasonable, it's like a, within a certain uh, factor of you know, the optimal results. So. So again, as I told you, that this is an example of something that is, you know, has both great research as well as has had great business impact. Also, can I ask one question over here? So the cost of the price automatically be determined at this point because if I ask a very stringent constraint, do you determine right there with the algorithm or something? The cost is a part of this also. You can say that I, I want it to cost this much. I see. Uh, so okay. there may be non-feasible solutions also. You may want to pay five cents and you want a delay of one millisecond. So clearly, <coughs> there's no feasible solution to something like this. I mean, this will compute on a solution only if it's feasible, right? So uh, I'm not going to go through this. So there are a bunch of these, as you will expect, different types of constraints. Yes? I just had another question. I was wondering, one of the concerns I would have is that if you have database backed web applications, for instance, stateful applications, that the cost of consistency goes up. Because you now have to more likely synchronize across the different yes, of course. mini data centers, right? Which is typically something you're trying to avoid, like the plague today. I see. Yeah, but uh, I absolutely agree with you. So, this is where you have to pick the applications that will make sense for something like that. For example, if you have camera networks, for example, London has something like, I don't know, 100,000 or million cameras. Right. You don't want everything to go to a single data center, right? right. So, you want to filter that, you know, for some, sure. right. something like that, you know, where they're kind of independent of each other. Mm -hmm. And uh, what do we call virtual telco applications? We want to put very simple network elements all over, and we want to, to bring intelligence in a common place. Right. And again, many of these virtual telco applications have very strict delay requirements, mm -hmm. and uh, that you cannot do in a central right. place. Right. In fact, there was a you know uh, AT and T after they deployed uh, uh, you know uh, uh, when they, they did, uh, 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 deployed these uh, iPhones. So the signaling traffic on their network went up. So we looked into whether we could move this into an Amazon cloud, and we could not, because we would not meet the delay needs for at and network. So is this a primarily for your own, I mean, the network operator applications? So all the examples you're giving are more like the telco application. Uh, are there good uh, end user applications for which you want to do partitioning like this? Mm -hmm. and what are the examples of end user applications where you can do partitioning like this? Well, uh, there's a demo that we showed at Mobile World Congress for this, you know, and uh, uh, this is uh, for virtual desktop. You know, there is this problem of uh, van acceleration. So if you can somehow bring the logic and the information close to the users, clearly that would be. So that's, that's one example of this, you know. I mentioned camera networks, you know, where you can filter information. Virtual telco is a third application. So there are a bunch of applications that I can think gaming. of. Huh? Gaming, network gaming. Network gaming will be another so one, of course. Of course. Yeah, but I think you know the, the the Amazon type situation is where they're just trying to sell excess capacity, right? And uh, low utilization of time. So I don't know whether you know, that's sometimes the philosophy of the cloud, you know. Well, uh, in, well, well uh, okay, cloud computing is like, you know, is to uh, computing what uh, internet was to, uh, to, uh, to communication. So essentially you can do statistical multiplexing. 
So if you have big data application, you have like large data sets, MapReduce, et cetera, for that, something like these large data centers, you cannot beat them. This is not the solution. Right. Don't even try that, you know? Doesn't, um, so this is like a, uh, it is a complement to this other one. You know, I, again, as I mentioned, there may be even more applications for a system like this than for these large data centers. So, so there are applications where I make a case for. So would you consider uh, CDN to be a good application for this? For content caching and rather than of caching course. it inside? Of course. CDN, yeah, I mean, in fact, yes, you can put CDN also in this, you know, and also things like even van acceleration, which no, is the logic. Uh, what I'm trying to understand is maybe you can versus, do you think the C CDN is the hottest application in some sense? So are you using this kind of uh, uh, stuff for CDN or... That is not the driving application. No, that's not the driving application right now. In CDN. fact, we do have a CDN product called Velocix. Uh -huh. you know, but uh, so we're not really looked into. But clearly, of course, you know, if you have uh, uh, data centers, small data centers, right close to you in the central offices, of course, you, know, you can put content there also. And so. Yeah, but the, the main issue is the latency. In fact, in Amazon, you have three very large data centers, and in the U.S. alone, you cannot. Uh, you can reach only 70% of the population under 150 milliseconds. So if you need better latency, you have to go through something like that. Oh yes, yeah. right, so right, really right, right, so. yeah, right, right. Again, the, I can understand for yeah. some applications the latency yeah. is very critical, like yeah. the gaming is potentially one, this uh, radio application you're talking about, I can imagine latency is very critical. But as soon as you have human in the loop, application besides say gaming, why is that latency of uh, 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 another 100 millisecond matter? <coughs> well, uh, again, sometimes you know, it depends on where the application is. For example, the typical example that gets used for van acceleration is if, you, for example, you put a file in a data center and your, the program is on your computer, there are 50 round trip delays. So if the file is somewhere, say, near Hoover Dam, it will take uh, something like uh, five seconds before you can, you know, get a response to anything you do. So that's probably not going to work out very well. So again, uh, uh, you know, uh, there are applications that are going to need this, but that applications that don't require that, and clearly you can do much better. Uh, uh, you know. Also, another thing about this is that since this is very close to the access lines, the bandwidth costs are much lower you know, for backhauling all the way back to. So that's yeah. another one. So again, this work, uh, I have to say that even this business is in early stages. This is something that, you know, uh, clearly companies that have these large data centers, they're well established. Uh, service providers are just getting into this space. But, they, but, but then they need some differentiator so that they can get in the business. I also. understand that the service yeah. provider differentiator is you have all the CEOs and you can deploy yes. something interesting there, but then you have to also say what applications are amenable to partitioning, right, uh, right. computing in this particular fashion to give you that edge that you're looking for. Well, uh, like the radio application you're talking about that is for the benefit of service provider themselves. It's not for the benefit well, of- Well, it will reduce mm -hmm. OPEX and CAPEX for them, right? So, uh, right. But, but then there is gaming, uh, they, there is uh, camera networks, uh, is, uh, so, so these, uh, and I would uh, virtual desktop, which is that you know if you do it in a large data center, that probably the performance <coughs> is not going to be very high. So in fact, uh, uh, you know, yeah, well, uh, okay. so in fact, I think believe that demo will be shown at Sitcom this year also. So if you're there, you could probably. Can. But for some of these applications you're talking about, if this resource resource allocation problem that you're describing. <coughs> Is that really is that dynamic? Because, for example, virtual desktop, you pretty much know uh, you need a VM and so on. So this is a very generic resource allocation problem description you're talking about. Okay, so there, there are two parts to this. There is something that's going into the product. There's other thing, uh, other one which uh, you know or researchers find to be very interesting. And some of this work may never okay. be used also. Sure, sure, sure. But some is being used. Mm -hmm. That's the that's the important part. I think one application we are going to see for those yeah. distributed, uh, more distributed clouds is uh, yeah, when the Internet of Things will uh, really grow massively. Right, and we right. will, uh, as, uh, as I mentioned yesterday, I, I don't see all the data that will be collected uh, yeah, by the sensors right, or the right. uh, description of the different <coughs> things in the environment to be uh, somehow centralized in, in the big data centers we have today. I think right. we will need some intermediate devices that will be pre-processing, that will 
definitely store part of the data, a filter part of the data, and that will run several applications uh, at the same time because they, uh, we are going to use those things for different type of things. So it's like the application no, the architecture will be distributed no, in the data centers and those gateways. For I those agree with it. You know which was the fastest uh, growing uh, networking company uh, for many years? Riverbank. Why did they, uh, you know, uh, why did they uh, were so successful? Because of all the problems with their Microsoft applications. If they move them into data centers, it caused all sorts of performance problems. In fact, just Alcatel Lucent has a few hundred of these boxes just to speed up working. So again, all this thing when we say that we're going to centralize everything in a data center, sounds very good, but it has issues. So in fact, if you look at uh, uh, you know, what Riverbed does is they put appliance close to you and uh, close to the servers. So they're solving the, uh, the, some of the problems also. So again, uh, an approach like this uh, could also be used for the van acceleration also. Not in individual boxes, but in the wireless uh, network operators. So I'm sure that you know, if we come up with infrastructure like this, there will be many applications that people will think about. You know. So again, uh, uh, now uh, I just want to briefly mention a, a program we have that's the part of this network cloud program that's been in operating systems. Okay. There's a person not too far from here in Antwerp, Sapi Melander, many of you probably know him. He's building this operating system. And this again, the focus is on reliability, real-time operations, which something something will support the, the, his virtual telco applications. And the, you know, also, uh, you know, for for high performance, it's also uh, very important that uh, the time for switching between applications is very quick. Also, so again, uh, uh, so he has come up with a bunch of techniques for doing this. In fact, he's building this system. So I don't know whether you, you know uh, Sapi, right? Yes, yeah, of course. Yeah. 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 So I don't know how many of us know. So, mm -hmm. so he was a professor at University of Twente, and now he came to Bell Labs in Murray Hill. Then. It, uh, you know, after we started a location in Antwerp, we moved back to this area. So again, this is an interesting area. This is something that you know perhaps uh, we can have further discussion about. So this is like a fairly large effort, you know, all the way from business, all the way up to this, you know. So the person who runs uh, this business, his name is Dole Schooler. He will not stop praising the researcher, so helping him. So every time I see him, so this is uh, like a good example of. Uh, something that, you know, which has both meaty research as well as, as business impact. Again, it remains where to be seen whether this approach really takes off. I have to make, clarify that. It's another issue related with yeah. the federation of those clouds, because uh, it could be a unique cloud that will be distributed, spreading out of the data center, yeah. or it could be the federation of the largest one with smaller local Oh yeah, yeah of, of course, you can say that the, the, the persistent information is kept in these large data centers, and you bring these processes close to users. That could be right. a small, that could be. And I was talking about this with your colleagues uh, in Israel a couple of weeks ago. Oh, I see. And uh, I understand that Architect Lucent has today an interesting solution for federating clouds. Means well, yeah, I'm sure they're doing a lot of interesting things. In fact, I was talking to uh, Jim about uh, this. Uh, one of his students is going to join this group soon. He's already there. Yeah. Already there? OK, good. Okay, I'll ask you for his name. Okay, good. Okay, so next I'm going to talk about uh, a virtual, uh, new virtualized cellular infrastructure. How much time do I have so that I can? You can finish in five minutes. I will use it. It's okay with you? Okay, can I have what, 10 minutes? This one is not open. Okay, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. 10 minutes. Okay, and I, I know that, you know. Okay, so again, uh, you know, these. Uh, I'm sure you, uh, all of you have seen these curves. Because of these smartphones, uh, data traffic is grow uh, on internet is growing even faster. So in five years, they, they expect something like five times, uh, uh, 30 times the growth in uh, traffic. So they expect something like two and a half billion smartphones. Out of uh, there are, by the way, about six billion phones today. And the service has been going to zero also. Yeah. So far. <laughs> well, I, 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 the reason yeah. is the amount of bandwidth that uh, was available yeah. is, you know, so I, again, you know, uh, uh, I don't know why this is. Uh, uh, let's see. Why there is a problem here? Let me just, it was when you changed it in order to. 
Maybe just for you. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Fine. All right. So this is better. So if you look at uh, like a major U.S. city, you need like over uh, 2,500 base stations. And there's a really, as you would expect, that the infrastructure would be extremely large for something like this. So what are some of the solutions that we have? One is you can come up with better air interfaces. You know, there's a LT, LT advanced. I don't know what is beyond that. I've been asking people. I don't think uh, what could be the 5G. And some of you have answers probably. The other one is, uh, you know, you do reuse small cells and femtocells. cells. And this is a very powerful solution. But again, this is a very tough problem also. The reason is that the service providers, they don't want to allocate separate spectrum to small cells and to micro cells. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, paid uh, billions of euros for these licenses. And they don't want to, uh, you know, uh, have separate uh, channels for each one of them. But if they start sharing the same channel, then there are all sorts of interference problems. So by the way, there is a, this is an area of research. In fact, uh, yesterday, Alfonso Vasili, some of the work that he mentioned is, and again, there's a fair amount of work in, going on in other parts of uh, Bell Labs also. Another one is uh, that you, know, you uh, try to use uh, spectrum in a more clever way. So in fact, there's a lot of work going on on using TV channels. That not being used much. So there is uh, this capacity, this is kind of uh, reaching a limit. So the, the, the best approach to deal with this is to kind of find a way of, uh, uh, you know, doing sharing as is done in uh, uh, packet networks on this infrastructure also. Again, this means virtualization, means statistical multiplexing, both for the physical infrastructure as well as for spectrum. So again, if you look at, uh, you know, there are two parts, as you know, to actually three parts, but I just focus on two, which are the ones that really matter here. Uh, uh, control uh, and data, the one I'm not going to talk about is the management plane. For the control uh, path, you know, uh, the, the requirements and processing are very, very low. So you can easily do it on any cloud infrastructure, but the delays are or a problem. And by the way, this is where network cloud solution would help a lot. Now, if you do data path virtualization, that's much harder because you know now you have to process payload, and this is where you need uh, data centers that have uh, specialized hardware, including GPUs, DSPs, etc. Uh, again, the, there's a spectrum sharing, but I'm not going to talk about it here. So there is a, a, a product that was announced by Alcatel Lucent that's called Light Radio. So the idea here is the following. Uh, you know, you have a very simple radio head is, uh, is, which, which has transmitter and receiver in it. And uh, uh, there's some circuits in that that will uh, con uh, convert the radio signal into a bit string. This will be compressed. That will be sent over a fiber to a uh, pool of uh, processing units. And the pool of processing units will be doing baseband processing also. This almost sounds like science fiction. What you're doing here is you take the radio signal, you are sampling it at twice the, you know, some of the electrical engineers, you know, it's twice the maximum frequency, and then you're sending the signals to a common place. And the signal processing is done there. So, by the way, uh, Operators in North America and Europe are not much, uh, really much interested in this. But in Far East, companies like China Mobile, they in fact are strong believers in this approach. <coughs> because uh, now, you know, here, as you, will, you can see, that you, know, you need a lot of bandwidth to carry information to this before we know. So, but if you have dedicated fibers, that's fairly easy to do. So we have these cubes. Then there's a system on a chip which will be used for virtualization. Uh, and again, this infrastructure will virtualize and you'll be able to run multiple standards. That means like a converged radio access network. So this uh, virtual telco application that we talked about, uh, you know, these, uh, they cannot be done using the current cloud solutions. And again, we need to have this uh, solution like uh, what I just talked about, network cloud. But you mentioned before it's uh, using a, a CPRI or another 
separate, separate, separate. There's a lot of work being done on making it more efficient also. Mm -hmm. So again, the first application is really some infrastructure small cells. This, uh, what is a vision that I outlined, this is more in the futuristic. Uh, this is something industry seems to be moving in this direction. So again, this is perhaps is an example of a software-defined network taken to an extreme. Right? It's a, you're doing even radio processing mm -hmm. in the cloud, right? Okay. So uh, there was one restriction I mentioned. Oh, you cannot do data uh, plane processing in uh, 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 general purpose processors. So we have a research program at Bell Labs where we're trying to see whether this can be done. For operating systems gurus, this is like, uh, just to show you the requirements. You need uh, 200 plus giga instructions per second. You need the real time needs just like 3 milliseconds. And there's a data constraint of 25 uh, microseconds. By the way, there's a paper on some of this research that will appear at Mobicom this year. So this is a, uh, uh, this is a very interesting project we have here. You know, something, uh, I don't think it will be something that you will see in a product in a few years because you know a lot of these base stations today use ASICs, etc., to reduce costs. So this is really pushing the envelope. Not only you're going to do now sampling, but you're now going to do processing on general purpose processes. And to be able to meet these types of real-time needs, I mean, you know, some of you have built these systems probably know it's not going to be easy. Probably going to be extremely hard when we almost <coughs> Coming to uh, limit. By the way, a lot of this work, uh, 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 you know, on this light radio, the cubes are being not, uh, you know, are being built in Stuttgart, not too far from me. So this, they, so they're building all sorts of cubes, you know, high power, multi-band, all sorts of things. So really, a lot of work being done in this area. So. Uh, very briefly talk about software-defined networks. This is something that, uh, you know, uh, Guru and I go back many years. In fact, uh, uh, Guru used to, uh, many of you, I don't know how many of you know, uh, uh, he started the Genie program at NSF, which is like a granddaddy of all the next generation internet programs. So I remember I went with a group of researchers to talk to him about something called soft router in those days. <laughs> It has a uh, fair amount of similarity to the SDN concepts. Clearly, I mean, uh, Guru and Nick have taken it to a point where I don't think we are anywhere good, but there is some similarity between them. You know, so we did. Uh, this is a precursor to that research. Now, uh, our company's view is that this is a great solution for data centers and constrained networks like enterprises, but for, for service provider networks, you know, where you want to have feature parity. With the current MPLS networks, you know these uh, you know, probably there are ten thousand different features that have been done over time. That will probably does not make sense. So for this, uh, uh, the, so, so folks have uh, come up with an approach that's called software-driven networks. So essentially, the idea is that the programmability that you have in the software-defined uh, network, you try to do it in existing network. But you need to be able to observe what's going on in the network and need to be controls. So uh, our current belief is that you can do uh, observation fairly easily using uh, Arto-like approach, but the controlling will be very hard. So this is some of the work that uh, some of the folks are doing in this area. So again, uh, this is a brief uh, introduction to this uh, soft router program. This was done a long time ago. And uh, there was a, the whole network consists of a bunch of uh, very simple forwarding elements. And uh, the raw computations are done in a few servers. And it's not centralized. I mean, it, it is like multiple uh, 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 these uh, control servers. And, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, each forwarding element may have control from more than one control element server. So even if one of them fails, another one fails. <coughs> In fact, there was a question that came to Guru the other day. Is it centralized? I don't think it has to be centralized. In fact, we had, in our research, we had come up with some ways of how we can do, uh, you know, hot standbys, et cetera, mm -hmm. something like this. So there were a lot of interesting research problems that uh, we solved, and we found there were a lot of benefits of this approach. For example, if you're going to do, uh, you know, OSPF computation for multiple forwarding elements in a single server, 
uh, you can see that uh, convergence will be very quick. Uh, but there were a number of interesting problems that we came up with. For example, if you had a new forwarding element, how do you, uh, you know, bring it down? Because it's, there's no path to any control in the server, so how do you bring it down? So, again, uh, uh, you know, I'm glad, very glad to see that, uh, uh, you know, uh, Guru and Nick are making such great progress in this area. So again, this is the work, I think this will be probably, in my opinion, with the future. Again, I had to clarify, this is the, my <coughs> personal opinion. I'm not saying it's the company's view. Uh, but uh, for, uh, in the short term, uh, or maybe in the long term, because th things don't ever go away, software-driven networks, this is the approach where you try to provide the same functionality on uh, the existing networks. You now, if you look at uh, the current, uh, uh, you know, networks, they have all these different things, protection switching, MC lag, FRR, they're like all these different features. So, I, I think for any new <coughs> approach, usually the question is whether does it make sense to build all of these features again on this network. So, I probably it does not make sense for that, but clearly, I think uh, for that, I think a software driven approach uh, 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 will be the right approach. By the way, both of them initials are STM. Okay, so we have a number of good programs with the uh, Linksys. Uh, so I have encouraged uh, a, a research uh, from the team here. Uh, uh, one uh, suggestion I made to Dan earlier today was that Bell Apps is like this uh, global organization, so if you can bring in people from some of these other places here, also the interactions with them, that'll be very good also. <coughs> so again, there was a presentation that was made by Giovanna yesterday. So again, uh, uh, I'm, I, I have a couple of charts on that, but she did a good job at that, so I'm not going to go through with that with the joint work that's been done here. And similarly, uh, Francis Basili also talked about the work on uh, self-managed networks also. Self-managed networks, by the way, is a very interesting area. This is uh, uh, an area where a lot of interesting research has been done. This is, there, there are some areas that attract a lot of great researchers, but somehow the practical impact of that has not really been felt that much. So self-managed networks is one of those uh, those areas. So uh, there's been uh, work done in many different parts of Bell Labs and a lot of interesting work on distributed uh, uh, linear programming algorithms, all sorts of things, AI techniques, uh, people have used all sorts of things to make. But its uh, impact has been on small cells. But uh, uh, this is an area which is really very important because in these uh, service provider networks, operational expenses are majority of the expense. They are like something like 70% uh, of the overall expense. So if you can somehow bring that down. So when we talk to service providers, uh, they normally tell us they want the systems to be zero touch. So something like this is really very important. So I think there's a, the bridging the gap between theory and uh, practice, it, 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 I would say, is the main, main challenge here. So. Again, uh, a lot of great work is being done here, and uh, again, uh, I'll see that, you know, that we keep working closely together. Okay. Thank you.